Hello everyone! Welcome back to the RationalInvestor.com's, uh, what is this? This is our YouTube frivolity! La la la, here we are, being crazy! RationalInvestor.com hey, And we're live, so that's good. Looks like that's uh, doing la, la, its la, thing. Here we are, being crazy! There we go. So we got a few people over there on YouTube hanging out. Um, you know, everybody, uh, if you happen to be a regular sort of YouTube follower, just uh, understand that what I do on Sundays while the school term is open is uh, just wait for them to finish. And then um, um, just dovetail right after they're done and uh, fire this up. So um, Kevin actually gave me today, I don't know what the hell I did with it, uh, but uh, that list of questions that the uh, level oneers had asked fall through. Probably spend most of our time looking at that today. Um, unfortunately, guys, you know, it, it, this is a kind of market here where it's going to be tough to fill the airwaves on a daily basis, uh, giving you new kind of conversation when it's basically the same conversation over and over and over again here. <clears throat> We are at the apex of a massive celestial event. Actually, about six celestial events. Uh, 2020 has been a nutso year anyway. Um, and it's probably going to get quite a bit more nutso-ish over the next six, eight weeks. So, um, you know, they always uh, sort of suggest that around U.S. presidential election years, you know, if you're a capitalist and you're here to make money from trading, all that kind of talk. Um, yeah, expectations into an election year, usually not that great. Uh, so, if anything, it didn't surprise me that the market's acting the way that it is. Um, so, what I need to do now, and uh, just a quick update, it looks like Seward's uh, refactoring the database or something along those lines, so uh, this data here looks uh, suspicious. Remember, this is all beta right now we're really uh, ramping up for january 1st launch of this thing live so take this information uh, with a grain of salt right for now but i did notice from our sort of internal uh health measure indicators and actually as you go through this list you can see it you know yeah the country funds there's 41 uh ticks higher but the slows 18 so you know it's bullishly stamped the s p 540 on the short term 26 on the slow, so that's bullish. I mean, a lot of the market is looking like this. Also, too, I noticed that uh, looking at things like the big stock indexes, they weren't really overly happy, but eh, a lot of the junior stocks, eh, just sort of bumping along, not really uh, in a big hurry to go up or down. Um, let's see where I can show you. Is that the page? Uh, I guess over here. Um, you know, we watch uh, a whole universe of names. Uh, and what's fascinating is, you know, a lot of these, it's not really like these uh, stocks are like uh, peering over a cliff. In fact, you know, here's a really good uh, lithium stock. And, you know, frankly speaking, that's actually looking kind of uppy. Uh, and I got a lot of these little names. We picked up a little bit of this uh, Chris, C R I S. Uh, and actually, this is one of my favorite chart patterns, a key reversal. Um, so uh, anytime I see key reversals, I get all excited. A lot of stocks that are looking like this, you know, and actually it's interesting, you know, in the transportation and the hospitality sector, that's a goddamn buy signal as far as I'm concerned there. So, you know, the, interestingly enough, the broader market doesn't really look too bad. And actually interesting, you know, things like the cruise sector, uh, you know, they knock the stuffing out of these markets, but, you know, they start going, putting in W's and stuff, and so we're starting to get interest in alongside. In fact, um, you know, the airlines, look at this, Delta Airlines, there's a W on rising volume, uh, Southwest W. Uh, not quite a key reversal on our little save, but I'm actually so interested that I might actually even just go buy this and play this W here, because that's a powerful engulfing bar nonetheless. Uh, so, you know, honestly, I'm not really that bearish of the stock market right here. The only problem in the stock market, I think, and actually our site members were uh, highlighting it really well, is if you do something like uh, Google, 
plus Apple plus I don't know what's the other one Facebook plus Microsoft uh, what is that there's five of them aren't there what am I missing Nah, I wouldn't really know uh, these are you know Nvidia is a, a fun company it's a semiconductor stock but it's not one of these massive behemoths the point I'm trying to make here is uh, if you um, well, divide by five, <laughs> I don't know if this is going to work or not. Oh, we'll see what happens. Um, I don't think that worked. <laughs> Steven was sharing this chart um, uh, earlier. I mean, maybe that's it. I don't know. But I just get the feeling Ooh. that... <clears throat> The, uh, the major stock indexes are probably going to follow a line. Yeah, maybe I have to put a bracket in here. Maybe that's what it is. I know, uh, like I said, Stephen posted this chart on Friday, and I was pretty impressed with it, something like this. Um, let's see, is that better? I don't know what's going it, to It looks the same. You know, if anything, what chart pattern? Actually, all the level winners are going to be doing this uh, going forward. Uh, but uh, what kind of chart pattern? In fact, uh, there's a site member who loves these chart patterns. He's become basically the guru on the site of these chart patterns. But what does that kind of look like? Yeah. So I wouldn't be surprised if guys like David O are probably aggressively hunting short ideas here. Um, and, you know, they have, uh, you know, the sad part about it is I did up all this, right? But just watch what happens if, uh, let's say, I disconnect this. And I go, um, I don't know, QQQ, NASDAQ 100 Trust. Oh, gee whiz, that kind of looks similar, doesn't it? So it's not really like the broader market is in trouble. It's uh, It just seems to me like these big cap monster mega cap stocks, they just represent too much of the market right now. Um, and if these guys have to correct, then... You know, the broader market might be like, well, man, no big deal, so what? Um, and yet, um, and yet, it's it's these guys' fault. And you know, the problem that I see here, I don't know whether you're seeing it or not. I mean, it seems to me that the whole world is rushing uh, away from the uh, capitalist and right wing and pro business, and you know, you can colorful it color uh, up the uh, analogies uh, with um, with um, orange hair to pay references or whatever but uh, I wouldn't be surprised if our society actually goes through a maybe like a five ten year period of hey these social media companies are way too big and way too powerful and way too influential in our society maybe it'd be a good idea to uh, to um, heaven forbid the terrible word, regulate these sons of bitches. Actually, you know, maybe uh, they actually have to be held accountable for some of the crap that they're spewing out. Imagine that, eh? That would be a crazy notion. Holy, you're a commie! You're a commie! Oh, yeah. Well, and that's the sad part about it, right? Fox and CNN are both owned by corporations. So there's yet another commentary about, you know, maybe... Um, yeah, well, and what I would love is, uh, the interesting thing is, um, um, I think you can make the argument that the whole blockchain kind of idea is very liberating. I mean, look at what's going on with Google right now. Google's a perfect example of that. I mean, in essence, now Google has become a censor. Uh, who gave them that job? So, you know, when are these crypto kids going to get around so we can get, you know, get rid of Google and YouTube and all this nonsense, do it all on the blockchain, and fuck your censors, you stupid assholes. I mean, who is it that, that you know, here I am talking on Google <laughs> to platform. Now, there's about the easiest way for you to get banned from Google. <laughs> Brian, is that really very smart of you? <laughs> So uh, don't be surprised if this channel all of a sudden just disappears. Hey, how's Dav doing these days? I saw the other day he was freaking out. Uh, oh, they killed me. They killed me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah.
Yeah, the funny thing is, though, I'd say that the AI is listening and they're writing notes because they're like, fuck, this is the only guy that actually knows what he's doing in the market. <laughs> I better I better learn from this guy. <laughs> uh, maybe we just, we'll just put away the bar stool uh, algorithms that say bar stools. Uh, we'll just put those on the sidelines. That guy does not to pick stocks. <laughs> When that TRI fires up his video, maybe we'll just uh, instead of uh, Insta ban uh, button, we'll go. Um, oh, maybe we should, maybe he might actually have something. Uh, uh, maybe Google's going. Geez, I gotta copy that guy's notes. Man, those notes were awesome. <laughs> Remember that was a. Uh, and oh, by the way, that gentleman did get back to me, and what a perfect answer. He's like. Uh, I'm sorry, Brian. I'd love to take your course, but I'm just way too busy. <laughs> Which is just because the guy was like, he's like doing a doctoral thesis. He's working on a rocket that's going to, uh, I think it's Pluto or something. He's mastering the stock market, you know, and just on a side gig, he's just been taking a few notes here and just uh, sort of observing me. <laughs> So uh, congratulations to you, uh, the the gentleman. Uh, appreciate it. If your schedule ever does let you uh, uh, participate, uh, you, you're more than welcome. I think uh, he had uh, a Glorifern or the GL8 or something like that was his username. Uh, so uh, I suppose I should quit uh, babbling away here and actually talk about something of value for you guys over here. So let's see what we got here. Over on YouTube, hey, there's a few people over there. Hello, YouTubers. Uh, Aditya uh, Bemoli says, BTC didn't fall much after KuCoin hack news and BitMEX Sega. Will it probably do the same in the election days? Mm, I don't know. Your guess is as good as mine. Uh, hey, there's Landon. Uh, Landon would uh, ask you all to kindly refrain from doing anything on October 8th. <laughs> uh, Aditya says again, Rational Investor, I better get your goddamn attention, so I'm going to put your name in bold here. BTC didn't fall much after KuCoin Hack News and BitMEX Saga. Well, they'd probably do the same in the election days. <laughs> I, get this per I get the impression this person wants to get my attention. Um, yeah, I know, Landon. Isn't that a perfect intro for you? <laughs> I saw you. See, that's the thing. I see you coming in, right? So you don't connect right away. Kevin does this to me every morning. <laughs> it's so funny. So, uh, I see you connect and all of a sudden I start talking to you. So you connect and all of a sudden I'm in like mid -sent mid sentence. <laughs> so, yep. October 8th, Mr. Crispy himself. <laughs> um... You know, the problem is, uh, Aditya, um, I don't know whether you've ever heard this from me before, and it's probably why a lot of people don't like me, is uh, I don't really like to get into the habit of making predictions. Um, I'll trade setups. Uh, I like to look for edge. I like to look for situations where, hey, I've seen this before. Usually when this happens, that happens. Um Actually making predictions of what's going to happen in the future, frankly, is kind of a mugs game. I mean, you just don't know. Did anybody expect Mr. Wonderful here to get come down with the sickness uh, this weekend? That sure was a curveball. Is it actually going to work to his advantage and he might win the election because of this? That would be definitely be a curveball. So uh, don't get into the habit of predicting the future. You just don't know what the hell is going to happen. Um, I know his Mars was, what? Oh boy. Um, actually be interesting to see if, uh, if that Mars is driving his boss. Um, yeah, well, and Alex makes a really good point. Ironically enough, uh, you know, and that's, that's the kick in the pants. Knowing what we know now, would Mr. Trump have probably been better to lose the election to Hillary? I bet you're looking back in hindsight, he's kind of going, jeez, I wish I had come along now. Then I could have blamed COVID all on this Democrat conspiracy left wing. <laughs> uh, all right. Ismail says, hello, Brian. Don't forget to complete your session about banking system. I saw this part from last BCS <laughs> three times. Where did I leave off? Oh, goodness. Uh, we were talking about Jekyll Island. Actually, we got Mr. Jekyll Island on the call here today. He was the one who uh, said, Hey, Brian, you got to pay attention to this Jekyll Island guy. 
Actually, I, I listened to a really interesting interview with the guy who wrote the book. Um, um, is it Return to Jekyll Island? Something like that. And um, he was just simply saying, and it's kind of sad, like what we have to understand about the banking system is that most people, probably 80, 90% of the population, they don't even want to know about the, how the money system works. It's too difficult. It just makes their head hurt. They want to go, punch a clock, do what they're told, eat lunch in the cafeteria, go for beers after work. Oh, better make sure to punch out or else you won't get paid for those hours. Uh, go to bowling night, eat pork chops, kiss uh, little Sally on the forehead goodnight, and rinse and repeat. And then, of course, you know... Uh, you know, we're gonna we're gonna all go on summer vacation, spring break down to Disneyland and empty our pockets into that uh, coffer <laughs> freezer doobies. No, these are not freezer doobie type people. I can guarantee you that. <laughs> um, so that's that's the the number one problem with the banking system is that because we're dealing with numbers and because we're dealing with hard realities um, a lot of people just don't want to even have the conversation so you uh, create an environment where people don't want to have the conversation then the rats right they can take over and i think that's basically what why the banksters continually keep hammering away hammering away hammering away hammering away until finally the public isn't paying attention and boom, they got gotcha. you. I mean, you think about, um, actually the whole financial services industry sort of works on that. It works on a very snail's pace, methodical, day after day, charge interest. Interest is compounding, right? And it's just, you know, monthly statements up the butt, you know, and it's just, they're, they're just mindless. Um, and as soon as you show any vulnerability, they pounce. Um, so as a result, um, the current system that we have in place, this democratically elected governmental system, actually it works really, uh, really in the banksters favor. You know, in years gone by, the only way that they could manipulate the system was to start, you know, um, you know, kicking the hornet's nest once every cycle. Uh, and try to create things like civil wars and stuff. Uh, now with these democratically elected systems, they actually have a very efficient way that they can bolster one side or the other uh, to manipulate the population to do one thing or another. And I wouldn't be surprised if we found out maybe 100 years, 200 years down the road, we'll never learn this in real time. This is the tragedy of the human situation. But I wouldn't be surprised if the history books 100 years from now, we find out that actually there is a number of these cartels that were all in open communication with each other, and they all colluded to work together to, uh, to make sure that their businesses stayed in business, and, uh, and the system just keeps going. Um, sadly, what it looks like to me is that we've gotten to the point now where the social safety net is uh, is literally crumbling uh, in our between our fingers, which is sad. Uh, it says to me that we're probably and uh, this was my hunch and I used to joke about it ten years ago and everybody poo pooed it, but I think you can really see it accelerating now. Um, our society is just simply going to move back towards that sort of Dickinsonian. Um, you know, think of Scrooge and a Christmas Carol. We're going to move back towards that kind of society. And there doesn't really seem to be much that the populace can do because usually it takes these massive, you know, long, festering social movements to actually affect change. So ironically enough, you know, guys like uh, Engels and Marx, they didn't even live to actually see their dream of, you know, worker rights and all that kind of stuff. They didn't even live to see those dreams realized. And the irony, this is the true irony of history, is the last place that those socialist revolutions were supposed to happen was in a uh, commodity-based country like Russia. <laughs> so it just goes to show that, 
you know, history loves to uh, to uh, make fun. Um, I just want to make sure. I don't even know if YouTube's even recording anymore. This, you know, it always is so screwed up here. What am I showing you guys? So uh, to finish uh, Ismail's thought there, let's just say, are we working? I, just don't, I don't know whether this is working. History <laughs> loves to. Uh, okay, uh, looks like we're back on cue here. Um, so to finish your thought, Ismail, part two of that conversation was, and I don't know how I can show you a chart of this. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if I have a pretty picture that goes along with this story. I guess probably the easiest way to see this is uh, what happens in an economy when uh, there is no outside intervention. Over here. So uh, let's go back 100 years. So this was a world. Uh, no, it isn't. Where's our world? Maybe over here? Yeah, this one. This is a world where um, the banksters hadn't taken control. The banksters actually, uh, they instilled themselves into the U.S. economy right here, right? 2013, 2014. This is where they snuckily went in and sort of passed the legislation to create the uh, central bank in the United States. And frankly speaking, if anybody actually looks at the history, it was criminal, outright criminal what they did. But because politicians know how to work the system, politicians were owned by the banksters, they got away with it. Uh, and, you know, the irony of it all is all through here, U.S. dollar itself incredibly strong. The banksters, of course, fucked over Europe through all their wars, um, you know, especially World War I in there. You know, a lot of the European countries were basically bankrupted following that. Soviet Union collapsed, or uh, Russia collapsed into a civil war. Um, so they set their eyes on the one remaining uh, pure currency that actually had some worth to it. And they attacked uh, the U.S. banking uh, system. And keep in mind that uh the and it's too bad this data doesn't go back but basically through the u.s civil war the banksters actually tried to bring down the u.s government and uh, lincoln was able to uh raise capital simply by issuing currency directly from the u.s treasury um and um and actually there's a it, that that uh that jekyll island um i i um Somebody happens to have it. I suppose we can share it on the YouTube page. But uh, that uh, video, uh, the lecture from the 1980s, I sure hope that video doesn't disappear. It's really a great piece. If you want to learn about the banking system. So how do you take over an economy if you are the banksters? And this is important to understand because in essence, this is how they operate now. And once they're in place, you can't get rid of them. Uh, so, uh, uh, this is directly to answer your question, Ismail. So, the banksters come in. Um, let's see if I can show this. Uh, are you still with me, Ismail? Call me Ismail. All right. <laughs> so, the banksters come in. They set themselves up here. But they can't really dictate terms, can they? Why? How does a bank dictate terms? And maybe that's the question we should ask. What's the one power that the banks have? Good. Uh, not really interest rates. Interest rates themselves are just purely a function of the market. Um, somebody answered it here. I don't know, on YouTube? What, what power do banks have? They got power to do something. And uh, let's assume that they're starting from scratch. There you go. So uh, Leon's getting it, issuing money. Maybe let's uh, <laughs> rock or no, we don't go that far. <laughs> they will definitely manipulate the politicians to get the laws passes that they want. That's for sure. Uh, the What I'm looking for here is they issue credit. Lending. There you go, Ishmael. So if, if they're in a position where, all right, now we're at the central bank, blah, 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 
But nobody's borrowed any money from them. Do they have any power? Anyone? Anyone? Do they have any power at all? If nobody's borrowed any money from them, and you walk by the bank and you go, hey, there's a bank. Do they have any power over you? No. No power at all. So what did they do once they got into power? You know, uh, got this got this legislation passed that said, you now have a carte blank to uh, run the banking system. And unfortunately, what that really implicitly implies, uh, implies is to run the money supply system. So, what are you going to do? You don't have any power. You've got this blank check. You now control the system. What are you going to do? How about go out and lend some money? All right, let's get a whole bunch of bitches on the hook. Does that not make sense? Hello? Anyone? You go and lend a whole bunch of money, right? What's the economy probably going to do? You go and inject a whole bunch of made-up money out of nowhere into the system? What's the economy going to do? Well, maybe yeah, definitely inflation because they say that uh, technically, I mean, there's a different um, take on inflation. Some believe inflation is uh, a function of uh, pricing. Other people believe inflation is a function of the velocity of money. So either way, you inject a whole bunch of credit, a whole bunch of free money into the marketplace. What's the economy likely to do? So, if you understand that, then you understand exactly what happened here. This really makes perfect sense. Joe Sixpack wants a business idea. He's thinking about building these crazy things that uh, you can send sound waves through the air and people can pick them up on the other end and, uh, and they can dance and have a good time radio oh that's a crazy concept but that was all the rage here rca became uh, the biggest tech stock of that period um of course automobiles they all went crazy does everybody know the story of um of um westinghouse right uh, george westinghouse is an absolute perfect analogy of this he built uh, the westinghouse electric company and uh, unfortunately, it was very, very capital intensive. Um, so he had to borrow a shitload of money to actually do it. And then here's the key. Why did this happen? Was this a function of the economy absolutely collapsing? and capitalism was over or did maybe something else help this along come down here so hard that's right so the banksters wanting to consolidate their power they lend out a bunch of money to the public get them on the hook and then literally cut that credit so the politicians right here are going, well, you know, you really shouldn't have gotten involved in this. If you're playing the stock market, it's a mugs game. The politicians are like, fuck you, banksters. Quit, you know, eh, Hubert Hoover. Uh, quit screwing around with our economy. You know, just, you know, quit, quit doing these money supply games. And the banksters are like, excuse me, sir, who's driving the bus here? Eh, we're going to restrict credit a little bit more. And the market just collapses and all the, you know, all the public that comes in and buys the top. How do you think they're feeling? Could this have maybe been a little bit softer of a correction? Just a nice 50% correction here. What was going on through here? And it turns out, historically, they say that the reason why the market just kept going down was not necessarily that the economy was so bad. 
It's just that the banks just kept restricting credit, restricting credit, restricting credit. Foreclose, foreclose, foreclose. And George Westinghouse is a perfect example of that. Built this huge electrical works empire. In essence, our electrical grid today. The banks actually backed uh, Edison. And uh, J.P. Morgan himself was very, very upset at what Mr. Westinghouse and what Mr. Tesla did in Chicago. Very, very upset. They actually made it a goal that they were going to take George Westinghouse's company from him. And they did. Just simply through, hey, you want to borrow money? Great, come and borrow money. We're your best friends. And then, oh, okay, we've got him on the hook. Now, oh, sorry, we're not going to lend you any more money. You're, you don't meet credit lending standards. Sorry, we're going to. And, you know, in these days, a bank could call or basically say, hey, we want our original loan that we gave you back at any time they wanted to. Now you can't do that so much, but what do they do now? Does anybody know what they do now? Which is kind of the same thing. Yeah, well, the question is, uh, and uh, the problem here, AE, is, uh, is uh, what's the one thing I can do to really fuck up all these statistics here? <laughs> so I don't know whether I even want to open up that Pandora's box, because I have been noticing lately, people have been like, Brian, forget about those stupid trolls and stuff. Just, you know, teach us. <laughs> so, all right. So did anybody uh, fill in that uh, the blank there? The, my question for you. While we are learning stuff, most of my friends and family are focusing on NFL. Yeah, exactly. Eh? I mean, it's great to learn a new uh, pass play, but it's not going to make you money. Um, anyway, so the point here is this is a really good example where the banks were sort of given an open invitation to take over the economy. They lent out to the public. They got them all nice and long. Everybody's borrowing money. In fact, you could argue one of the reasons why the stock market went up the way that it did was people were playing the market on leverage, on margin. You've probably heard that before. And then this is... And this is also a bit cheeky, too, because these were the money center banks. And like that's a thing somebody posted there in um, in YouTube, you know, like Rockefeller, Rothschild, who's actually European, but close enough. J.P. Morgan, who's actually just a bitch of the Rothschilds. Um, they're the money center bank people out of the east coast of the United States. But remember, the United States is technically a free market. Ar, 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 sure, yeah, right. <laughs> But the banking industry is actually controlled on a state-by-state -state basis. So technically, uh, this is one uh, reason why the banks in Canada, for example, are much, much more powerful than the banks in the United States. And in the United States, one might argue the creation of the Fed, half of their job um, is actually to try and put a lot of the regional banks out of business. But they'll never talk about that. It's so funny. When you uh, listen to Powell when he does his semi-annual Humphrey Hawkins testimony, almost every single one, um, there is a question and a concern about community lending bank standards. And what that's all about is the Fed in the United States, they are on a national scale and they can't penetrate into those local community markets because of state regulations. So it makes it very, very difficult. And if anything, it's probably one of the good selling features of the United States is this checks and balances and try and dilute the power base of federal institutions. Um, you know, I mean, it's really, you could look at the Fed, the U.S. Federal Reserve Board, very similar to the way the U.S. military uh, responded when Mr. Trump said, hey, send those goddamn tanks in to kill all those protesters. The military's kind of like, whoa, 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 that's not our job. We're, 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 we're to kill outsiders, not insiders. So you're going to have to go and look uh, for a different uh, a government agency to handle insider problems. That's not our problem. <laughs> so in a weird sort of way, uh, even within the banking system, you get that kind of stuff where it's like, who's, whose jurisdiction are we actually in here? Um, unlike the U.S., 
The banks, unfortunately, in Canada, they are so in bed with the government. They own the government. And I might argue that the model that's in place here in Canada was just a a natural evolution of the Rothschilds the way they took over the Bank of England. So I might argue that if you just want to see sort of the modern day incantation of what uh, the Rothschilds ultimate sort of dream banking system should look like, take a look at Canada. Basically, uh, the banks here have charters. There's only a few of them allowed. So in essence, they have a guaranteed business model and they have guaranteed no competition. I mean, talk about a fucking system set up, eh? Uh, and these banks, they're basically, I, you know, I watched, it was interesting. I watched um, one gentleman a few years ago uh, where, uh, you know, you say it's weird. The banks and the government work in conjunction here and they're sort of hand in hand. So the government says to the bank, uh, you freeze this gentleman's credit and uh, freeze all his bank accounts. And they're just like, yes, sir. And done. And you're just, you're screwed. So, you know, that's probably the ultimate dystopian big brother kind of nightmare scenario. But what's fascinating here in Canada is that most of the, most of the robots, they don't, they don't want to know about this stuff. They just want to, uh, you know, watch their Sunday morning football, right? Um, Want to know that uh, at least somebody in some sort of government role has got some sort of plan around things like pandemic, all right? That, that's that's really what Joe Sixpack really wants out of government. Um, so I thought it was interesting. I was listening to uh, that Jekyll Island guy, Um I can't remember his name. Probably should. And he was uh, he kept going on about one line. Why are why, why do we have this thing called government? Uh, doesn't that mean govern? Uh, why do I need to be governed? I thought I was a free person. So I thought that was fascinating. I mean, like just even the word government. There's a problem with that word. What does it imply? I guess, the, you know, the sad thing for people like me and I guess a lot of you watching this is, you know, you want to empower yourself. You don't want third parties to just basically tell you how you're going to live your life. And I'll tell you uh, what one thing I've absolutely noticed is that if, and it's of course a big if, if you get given the right direction, you can empower yourself. You can uh, break that model. You don't have to punch a clock. Uh, what I would really suggest you all do, and I've said this before, and I'll say it again over and over and over. You got to, you know, until you get to that point where you're sitting on a big pile of money. And trust me, it's it's a lot of it's comfortable just sitting on a big pile of money and not doing anything. But the one bad part about it is, fuck, man, you get fat. <laughs> I used to be a skinny mini my basically my entire life, <laughs> and now I'm just a big fat ass. <laughs> no thanks to you, Shane. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, quarantine my ass fat. Tell me about it. <laughs> So not only am I fat, but I'm also a loser. Jesus, these guys are, they're just, they're, they're merciless. <laughs> anyway. Um, yeah, okay, you guys are sharing that creature from Jekyll Island stuff here in the hangout here. Um, what are you guys, is that the video, John? Is that what you're sharing? I mean, we can throw it over there on YouTube. I would, you know, I would strongly suggest all you people on YouTube just watch this before the powers that be delete it because it's such a high, high quality. Ah, uh... oh, crap. It's giving me some garbage uh, link there. I don't know how to get the straight link. I hate when I do that. Well, let's see what happens. Boom. Google Meet. Yeah, look at that nonsense. I don't know whether that's going to take you there or not. Let's see. Oh, yeah, there he is. Okay. Oh, that's a, maybe that's a different one. 
from the same one? Oh, he's talking. Oh, that's a new one. I don't think I've ever seen that one. Okay, cool. Thanks. Appreciate that. So I have an Edward Griffin. Uh, 76,000 views there. So yeah, a little bit of uh, public interest. So that's good. So there's a, there's a video, crazy ass link there for you. I sure hope that works. I don't know if that link will work or not. Jeez, listen to that. My pipes sound like they're about to blow up. CSIS is uh, tapped into my um, my uh, shower system. <laughs> you can hear them. Actually, this might be a better quote. I'll get rid of that other one. There you go. That's probably a bit better. I uh, will do a j Now I'm just wasting everybody's time. Jackal. This one. I don't know how you spell that, though. Uh, J E K Y L L J E K Y L L hmm. funny name. Okay, so um, my apologies for uh, for wasting time here, but I wouldn't mind getting. Um, Uh, shared OBCS and who was that? Gotta give you a thank you. Uh, that was from John. Thank you, John M. Thank you, John M. All right, so at least we got that there now. We'll make you fam famous, John M. Okay, uh, where were we? So, you know, I like this as a demonstration of the powers of the bankers because actually this is a this is a market that hasn't been sullied by bad debt. The problem now is that we can't really look at the current market state. Technically, believe it or not, this market, especially from that 2000 peak, this market actually looks exactly the same as this market. It may not look like it, but believe it or not, this is identical image. <laughs> you wouldn't think so, eh? Yeah, that doesn't quite look the same. So how can Brian say something like that? The point here was that the US dollar was sort of the rock. It was solid. Yeah, it was... It was sacrilegious, especially back in this time, because of what you know the Europeans learned through the First World War about just endlessly printing money to buy more warships and tanks and machine guns to kill your enemy. Their currencies basically became worthless, right? And the banksters, of course, diluted the shit out of their currencies so that they became basically pieces of paper that had no fundamental value to them. Through that period, right, First World War, you know, European economies just absolutely decimated. They looked over across the Atlantic and they said, fuck, man. And the good part about it is just, be just before the First World War started, they got themselves set up in the U.S. So in a weird sort of way, was maybe the First World War encouraged now that they got themselves set up here to start dismantling the European uh, empire and get everybody moved over into the system that they just bought. That's kind of sucks how how coordinated all this shit is, eh? So through First World War, British, German, French, they all just blow up their budgets because they got to kill the enemy. So that means we need more warships, we need more tanks, we need more machine guns, yada, yada, yada. To the point where they just have no money. Of course, the banks love this. Oh, you want to borrow more money? Sure. Oh, you want to borrow more money? Sure. Oh, you want to borrow more money? Oh, you can't repay? Well, I guess the other guy will come in and take over, and then we'll create things like armistice treaties and war reparation treaties, where, remember, the banks lent the money to, like, the Brits and the French, and even probably to the Americans to a certain degree. Um, Lend-lease, right? You guys have heard about lend-lease. All that. Mind you, that, I think that was the Second World War. But anyway, they did it, I remember, in the First World War, too. Um, 
So the bankers lend lots of money, but in the fine print, the bankers all say, if we lend you this money, you have to honor the debts of the vanquished. So in essence, banks, bankers never lose. So at the end of the First World War, what did the winning side do? They went, fuck, man, we don't have to pay all these goddamn German debts. I know, let's create war reparations so the Germans pay back the loans to the bankers and we don't have to pay these fucking bankers. Uh, we all know how war reparations went, eh? That, that probably wasn't the best idea. Um, so uh, they're nice and established in the United States. They've got their central banker license. How do we now enslave the population? Let's go lend out a whole bunch of money to the public at, of course, crazy interest rates. Can the public actually afford to ever pay this stuff back? Probably not. So we've got them, right? And of course, if they don't pay the loan back, then we collect the collateral and we can foreclose on any hard assets that they might have. So a double grab. So in essence, I think that's exactly what happened here. The problem, if we sort of fast forward to today, is unfortunately the United States and um, and um, the U.S. dollar uh, is not pristine anymore. In fact, I would make the argument that um, I think you could make the argument that the U.S. dollar avoided massive devaluation through uh, the 1960s through the creation of this fiat monetary system. The problem is that through, you know, so in essence, this cycle, and keep in mind, these are just demographic cycles. This is the way the economy is supposed to behave. But through this cycle, right, now that uh, the U.S. dollar uh, the bankers now own the system coming out of, and, you know, uh, Roosevelt, uh, New Deal, all that. Now the bankers are in complete control. Uh, run the economy up. Great. Uh, this is the greatest generations, their greatest cycle. Then we go into uh, this is their greed part of their cycle. This is the fear part of the cycle. So we go into them wanting to move to retirement. Under normal circumstances, this is what would happen. Since the bankers are already in place, though, they're not going to let this happen. They don't want to see their equi equity collapse. So what do they start to do? They start to encourage the politicians to start sacrificing the underlying currency. Just like this was the death knell of all the European currencies, I think that they were encouraged to wage war on each other and basically bankrupt themselves. So through this part, we create the fiat currency system, but the banks still have one missing piece of the equation. They don't have everybody heavily in debt. What I find interesting now is, you know, through this pivot right here, the banksters uh, corrupting uneducated, you know, movie personalities into political positions this movie personality, Hollywood actor, and the sad part about it is this event right here where the banksters took over the economy, this was when they corrupted a Princeton uh, University professor who really, you know, really bought into this whole Keynesian kind of idea, bought into this sort of new world revolution uh, modern monetary theory, if you will, and the banksters just played him like a fucking deck of cards. Um, and one might argue that this is how they were able to instill themselves. They totally conned uh, this guy named Woodrow Wilson. I think you can make the argument that they did it again here in that they got a Hollywood, poli uh, Hollywood figurehead to come into Washington and say, it's okay for us to run deficits. It's okay for us to, uh, to spend more money than we have because we've got these wonderful friendly bankers who will be more than happy to lend us all the money they want or we want because, hey, the banks are on our side, right? We're all in this together, right? Does that not sound a pretty good sales pitch? 
I might argue that it, it really wouldn't have mattered who the politician was. Um, this economy, cycle-wise, was ready to grow again, right? Uh, especially for the level oneers. Um, try to teach you. Um, I don't know whether I have it handy or not. Probably. Does anybody have the uh, the uh, Dow Gold uh, chart that I do up? I could load it up here, but it's just going to be a mess, and it's going to take me five minutes to set it all up. But in essence, you know, every 35, 40 years, just think you know, normal human generations, we go through a part of a generation where we're working more, and then we go through a part of our generation where we're working less. And the economy is supposed to be nothing more than just a representation of that economic activity, like the stock market. That's what it's supposed to be. Of course, we've been completely corrupted because this thing now does not accurately reflect um, the economy. It's highly, highly, highly manipulated. So anyway, point of the matter here is this was a 30, uh, well, uh, yeah, like a 35 year generational cycle. This was a 35 year generational cycle. And uh, through this period, of course, uh, gold prices went up appreciably. So if you actually look at this asset, not versus US dollars, but versus gold, then what you see is a very normal cycle pattern. Does anybody have those? Uh, you guys aren't helping me out, out much here today. Does anybody happen to have those uh, chart links handy? I can show these people on YouTube. I'd appreciate it. I got met with crickets there. You guys are you guys realize in the hangout here, if you're here, you're here to help me, right? <laughs> you're not here just for a free ride. <laughs> that's the uh that's the the cost of being here. <laughs> anyway, um so this was the end of one cycle. This is the end of another cycle. And then at this point, some clown, some stupid audio Hollywood actor that really doesn't understand economics at all, he comes in and says, hey, everybody, go out and borrow all the money you want. So now we live in a society where basically the value of this thing over here has just been destroyed. It's just been gutted. You might argue that you know, this was a very coordinated effort to destroy and just gut the European currencies back then, you know, power shift over to North America, ramping up of the credit to the public and then pulling the credit out and basically taking over the economy. U.S. dollar is pretty pristine, so we can keep working this thing. Then through here, uh, we're going to, we don't want this to happen, because remember, we're banksters. We've already got all the equity through all of this uh, destruction here. So we don't want the equity market to fall, so what are we going to do? All right, let's get the politicians to sacrifice the currency. In the first form, we're going to leave the gold standard. So all of a sudden, currency becomes much more or much less valuable uh, as gold prices go shooting higher. But at the same time, this thing, this facase, does not break down. And of course, equity right, stays the same. Then we get into the baby boomers generation, and holy fuck if they just fuck this thing up. I mean, this is just a train wreck. Uh, oh, look at this. Maybe we've got some, uh, some help here from you guys. Peter, did Peter find my chart for me? I mean, I suppose I could go and for it on Google. No, that's not it. Uh, all right. Well, let's we'll stop the show for a moment. Let's see if we can go find the chart. Shane, you should have this stuff out of your back pocket here, man. Um, problem is, I never know uh, what hashtag to use and all this stuff. So. Uh, any level oneers, you should have it handy in your notes. Invest. Let's see what happens. Nope, nothing. Uh, I wonder how I would have labeled it. Anything? Nope. Tell you, uh, Google is terrible. Uh, Twitter's terrible for searching for stuff that you posted in the past. I don't know how I would do that.
Hmm. Probably not gonna work. <laughs> Nothing. Not a single result. Come on. Piece of shit. Uh, I don't know. Did anybody of you guys find it? It's very hard for me to do these lectures. Um, if uh, I have to stop and find all my notes halfway through. Let's see. Somebody added this. Let's see what we got here. No, that's not what I want. Uh, darn. Uh, maybe I have it in the library. I don't know whether that's a good anecdote or a bad anecdote on our school program, but I would have thought the level winners would have been able to pop this up here in a second. Uh, probably uh, more a loser teacher kind of talk. All right, let's see what we got here. Yeah, so here's a uh, chart of the uh, Dow. Um, if we break the chart into these cycle patterns, right? So um, here is what I like to call the uh, post US Civil War uh, greed and fear cycle. And the irony of it all is we usually end these cycles almost exactly where we start. If we look at the gold uh, Dow ratio. So here's this greatest generation. And I think they sort of kicked in. Their cycle was right around 1947. And believe it or not, this is exactly where I think we are right now in these cycles. So uh, this is the greatest generation. Uh, greed and then fear. And again, like I said, Usually what ends up happening is we leave the fear cycle at almost exactly the same place we started the fear cycle. So here is Mr. Reagan. Hey, you can spend all the money you want. Who gives a fuck? We'll never pay it back anyway because the banksters don't want us to pay it back. Uh, try and figure that one out. So greed, baby boomers, fear. The only problem here is that they went and diluted the shit out of the currency right in here. So as a result, you look at this chart and you go, well, that doesn't look like this. It doesn't look like this. So what the fuck are you talking about, Brian? Loser! <laughs> uh, Brian being stupid. So this is, this is assuming that they're not fucking around with the, the currency, right? This is assuming that this thing, this number thing over here stays equal. But unfortunately, we don't live in that world. So there was a very long time in economics that we had a simple principle. Hey, there you go. Thank you, Andre. Uh, and is that an updated one or is that the one that I'm showing? I think that's the one I'm showing right here. Right? Like the last time I updated this, we were still using the .co website. I know I produced one of these uh, for the level oneers. Can somebody that's in the level one program just find it? Because I did update one last term, and I think I got uh, I think I got Grim to disseminate it out. Oh, Shane sending me PMs. What's he sending me here? Yeah, I love that. Uh, he took Thomas ad addition ideas. Oh, is that a a different one? Um. But uh, yeah, Shane, this is the original Jekyll Island um, documentary. I mean, it's boring as shit, right? If you're not an economist, three and a half hours long. If you're not an economist, you're not going to understand this. But a lot of you guys, of course, are economics uh, sort of aficionados. So if you fancy yourself in economics and a trader and the man, uh, this is definitely, uh, this is required watching. So I'll even add this in here too. Uh, Shane's buddy, we'll call it that. Shane's buddy's video. Hashtag the man. There you go, Shane. Thank you for that, uh, that share. Uh, all right, what do you got there, Will? Is this a new one? Uh, maybe it is. Uh, I should probably update the one in the library here. Who's that clown? Uh, okay, this is a different one. This is uh, understanding the four different asset classes. <laughs> you guys are great. Uh, you're trying. <laughs> Thank you for trying to help. So that's good. Um, let's see. Maybe I'll go. And probably all the people on YouTube are like, well, man, this is boring, man. When's he going to talk about crypto? 
Um, oh well. Level one Q220. I think it's in here. Pinned messages. Uh, One thing I do like is uh, with this rocket chat and stuff is at least we have a repository to save this stuff. Hey, there we go. Is that an old one or a new one? Ooh, here we go. Pretty, pretty. <gasps> Found it! Yay! Actually, here's a couple really cool images. I think I have one of these. Uh, Bitcoin. Yeah. Sorry, Leon. Hey, there's Dina. Dina, did you uh, did you think you did well taking that level one course last turn? Dina was our contest winner. So if you uh, feel a little bit more educated. All right. So here is the updated version. And I think all you guys really should put this in your notes, especially you level oneers. Um, so I'll whoops, how do I do that? It does that, eh? I I hope I can throw this. Uh, I don't know. Let's see what happens if I put it in here. Probably in the, gonna blow the whole thing up. Oh yeah, Ugh, that's a mess. Can't do that. Um, I think, unfortunately, you YouTubers, I can't really help you guys. Uh, well, one thing I can do here, we can go like this, and then we can go like this, and we can go like this, and we can go like this, uh, like this, and like that. This is where you two times, uh, the video. All right. I think hopefully we can do that there now. So, uh, what is this? This is the uh, Dow uh, monthly cycles. Boom. Oh, you didn't work. Why didn't you work? Uh, copy. Oh. Oh, that should work. Paste. Nope. Damn. Uh, oh, maybe I have to upload it. Oh, jeez. Now you guys are going to see all my porn. Uh, what am I going to do? <laughs> <laughs> I upload porn? What? That doesn't make any sense. I don't know how the fuck to do this, guys. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm trying. I'm wasting everybody's time. Okay, let's try this again. Bang. Maybe uh, what I'll do is, uh, well, what the hell, let's upload it to screens. If I was being uploaded, it shouldn't take long. I never use this because uh, just, hey, there we go. Copy. Now let's see what happens. Uh, paste. All right, so hopefully that's a nice little uh, long-term cycle Dow chart there for you over on YouTube. Way to go. So again um you know this is basically your uh post uh, civil war generation this is your greatest generation this is your baby boomer generation and you're kind of saying well brian you know if these things are supposed to be equal why do they look so different this sadly you know what this really is this is just simply um oops um this is just simply the process of how the banksters go about making a very very strong very powerful very rich country in a basically a century how they basically have bankrupted the country it's an interesting graphic um so to see this image what does these cycles normally look out look like without the blatant manipulation of this thing over here that's where we have uh, this image. So in essence, this is that 1930s. Uh, no bankers are allowed to fuck around with the, the currency. The currency is stable. The currency is strong. This is year 2000. Of course, they've politely changed the name of diluting the currency to, oh, quantitative easing. 
I mean, it's fascinating how uh, they can come up with these fancy hootenfalutin names for these things. But the long and short of it here is they're just the growth cycle, the economy, it has to go through this natural process. You know, what goes up must come down. Newton's first law of physics, right? Or maybe it's New Newton's second law. The problem here is that you cannot get reelected as a democratically elected politician if you let this happen. It's really simple. Um, so this go round, how does it look? This is why I said, I get the feeling, I think you could probably stretch this out a bit more. That peak probably corresponds with that peak. This trough probably corresponds with this trough. This peak here probably corresponds with this peak here. And the pullback that we're seeing right now is is this right here. That, that's my general feeling. The problem here, of course, you know, there that would be sort of that March dump, right? Now we've worked our way back right up against the top, just like this. My hunch is that basically this is what our next year or two looks like. What I find fascinating is there is so many people um, that... Uh, are absolutely convinced that we're just a, right around the corner to a crash. And they're publicly talking about crash, 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 crash. Uh, and I think they have it completely wrong. Uh, we are not in the same part of the demographic cycle to support the crash thesis. Ironically enough, all, you be, um, all the baby boomers, they're gone now, right? When this was a perfect crash scenario, and this is 1929, this was their generation all ramped up, people borrowing money, right? Free money, free money, free money. Uh, and then, you know, the banksters pull the carpet out. Well, they kind of did the same thing in 2000. I remember going through this. Um, ironically enough, when the banksters actually le loosened credit and uh, loosened tightening standards, um, ironically enough, they actually turned it around and blamed the banksters for the uh, buildup of equity prices. Again, thinking more along the lines of um, what does our non-diluted currency market look like? Right? A lot of people actually blame this moving up higher because the banksters left interest rates so uh, low. But interestingly enough, if you actually look at even through Greenspan and, um, and um, Bernanke's uh, term, the dilution of the U.S. dollar was well underway, even while they were in power. It's just most people in the public didn't notice it because it was very slow and it was very quiet. Um, so long and short of it here is we live in this funny sort of politically driven market that, uh, that requires higher equity prices so these politicians don't lose their jobs and we don't, we're not hearing people screaming for revolution. But you know the real irony of it all is that really in reality, our economy has done that. You know, this is undiluted, uh, but, um, you know, here is the diluted. Right? And this is where we are now. So I uh, remember I showed you that image uh, from Rocket Chat there. This one here. Uh, this was, I, I did this a few years ago, wondering what would this transition look like. This is the crazy Fakazi uh, market. So believe it or not, Something like 150,000 on the Dow. That's not actually totally unrealistic. It's not that the Dow stocks are worth 150,000. It's that the goddamn currency is worthless. <laughs> so interestingly enough, you know, this is your, uh, this will be the new, and, and it's interesting how I say uh, Generation X boom. Sorry, Gen X is, uh, sadly, Gen X, they're, they're left in the dust. This is the millennials uh, generation. And, you know, I wonder, this is just me, I wonder whether you millennials are going to have to go through this, um, through your life. And we're going to actually, at the end of this, call the millennials the greatest generation of, of um, 
of the 21st century. I got a funny feeling that they're going to ramp this up, just like we said here. Then ultimately the U.S. dollar is going to absolutely collapse and the whole reorganization of the world. And that would actually be a much better time for quote-unquote crashes at the end of the greed cycle. Public, of course, comes in very late in the market. They'll get absolutely destroyed. Uh, but demographically, that actually makes a lot of sense. So I don't see the big reckoning, the big wipeout coming, actually, for another probably 15 years or so. You know, ironically enough, I mean, the, the, the historical similarities are shocking. But I think, you know, we're very much like in this kind of phase right now here for you guys. Um, and, you know, that's sort of going back to... Um, What did um, the market do through the last crazy um, uh, COVID? Mind you, it was Spanish flu then. This was the 1918. It's so cool that we have this data now. This is the 1918 Spanish flu stock market. And my hunch is that our market's going to look something very similar along these lines. Um, and probably, you know, you are here now. I think we're probably right about here. So, uh, you know, um, the stock market was very strong back in, the, you know, the end of last year, beginning of this year. Got its ass kicked. They rallied the market right back. But you're saying, well, Brian, isn't the stock market at new highs? I'll show you in a moment why I'm saying that. Then we have consolidation here for a few years. This, of course, is where... The public is like, ah, oh, sky's falling, crash is coming next week, crash is coming next week. But you, what you have to understand is that the stock market will never crash if people are looking for a crash. It just won't happen. The irony of it all is that when everybody starts talking crash, usually the stock market goes straight up. <laughs> So the fact that everybody is, you know, and especially like, you know, left wing politicians and, you know, people that really don't have any business talking money, when they start talking about crash, usually that's that's not a good time to be thinking crash. I don't know. Eh, prove me wrong. Who knows? So believe it or not, like, I definitely think that at some point down the road, there is going to be a reckoning with the U.S. dollar and the U.S. economy. I mean, do we make the transition where China now becomes the world's reserve currency? Who fucking knows? You can't write better fiction in reality, so don't get into the habit of trying to do that. But my hunch is actually this is what's coming ahead of us over the next you know, 10, 15 years. And then once we hit that, particular generational cycle peak then we do the whole goddamn thing all over again so ironically enough even with the dilution this is now looking very similar to uh to this chart i mean they're they're looking very similar so like i said you are here right now that's kind of what i think this is right you are here right now so what this would imply is maybe we have to come back and sort of swim around here for a year or two. That wouldn't surprise me at all. Um, why I think it looks like this, um, and this is where I like to do the side-by-sides. So yeah, this is the dot-com uh, boom peak, right, 99.0. And if we take into account the Fed... Uh, dilution of the money, i.e. M2 money supply. In reality, you see, holy shit, these things look almost identical. So really, that's what I think is going on here. So Anyway, I don't know whether that helps. That was kind of a weird rant. Not quite sure why I got into that. Um, so I guess, number one, do you understand now how the bankers, uh, Ismail, that was sort of part two of the conversation, you know, and here is a fantastic example where the bankers, they will increase the lending, increase the credit to society. Of course, society loves it. Roaring 20s. They don't really know what the fuck's really going on. 
So now the bankers, they look at their balance sheet and they say, awesome, everybody is loaded up. Everybody's taking out loans. Everybody thinks we're going straight up. Let's pull credit. Pull credit, obviously all of those assets. And like I said, uh, Ishmael, I think it was Ishmael. No, no, it wasn't. Who was it that asked there to start today? That was, uh... oh yeah, okay, so... Was it Ishmael? Anyway, hopefully that was you who asked that question. Um, okay, cool. So you got it. Right? They pull the credit. Think George Westinghouse. In fact, uh, I think if anything, all you YouTubers, I think if anything, uh, you should all really uh, take some time. In fact, everybody, if you have time on the site. George Westinghouse and this the tragic sort of uh, end game of George Westinghouse um, uh, is a really, really, like really, 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 really good uh, analogy of the banksters and how basically they don't do anything and yet they can accumulate incredibly powerful, uh, valuable resources just by simply uh, controlling the credit cycle. And the problem here, and this is where uh, they own, um, I'm going to put required watching. Because most people don't understand that uh, usually the banksters, they're not on your side. Oh, yeah, you know, publicly, and especially when times are good. Oh, yeah, they're going to spin the story that they're your best friends. I mean, look at uh, this Powell guy. He seems like a pretty uh, agreeable guy. He doesn't seem like the kind of guy who's going to foreclose on your home and kick you out of your house, does he? He seems like a pretty friendly face. But make no mistake about it, that guy is, uh, he is not your friend. That's the worst part about this, people. They're not your friends. Just get used to it. Accept it. What's uh, Brian's uh, lifelong adage about uh lending and borrowing let's see if you people any of you people let's see if you actually get this it's an old jewish expression heaven forbid excellent peter you rock star anybody on youtube gonna get this there is one really easy way to avoid this whole fucking problem. Problem is our whole society, especially with like home ownership. Oh, you got to own your home. Got to have a mortgage. Got to own your home. Well, technically, if you have a mortgage on like 70, 80% of the equity on the home, do you actually own the home? No. I don't know what idiot conned the public into that nonsense. And, you know, like, uh, here's a great example of the banksters and the way they fuck the public over. In, um, in this period, they had the politicians right here. They literally had the politicians tell the public that they, they encourage every single American to be a homeowner. Now, wait a minute. Are there, every American, has every American got a job? Is every American a good employee? Are they actually really worth taking the risk and, and actually lending these people money? And yet, the public message from the politician was every American should be a homeowner. In essence, setting up a whole bunch of people that through here, and I remember the goddamn commercials, lost another loan to die tech. Any of you people over on YouTube, uh, you ever uh, seen, remember those commercials? Um, and do you understand, Will, that it's a manufactured message? Why would that message be created? And obviously, it's because the bank... Oh, fuck. <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh, the banksters did not like that. <laughs>
<laughs> uh, I always find it amusing when uh, Google seems to kick out at very opportune moments. I don't know whether I'm still here. Am I still here? I mean, I never, never used to have uh, this kind of shit happen. There's no reason why that should have happened whatsoever. So, very disappointing. Anyway, uh, it'll be interesting to see what happens to the YouTube screen. It should blow up here any second. Uh, uh, all right, so just to finish off that thought, um, the politicians are financed by certain industries, right? You know, politicians are... I mean, hell, you see the way these goddamn major media outlets, news, eh, they're not called news. Um, um, you see how they're, they're, the message is stunningly corrupted. So biased one way or the other. And really, you know, I might argue that this is a function of the end. Uh, it's ironically enough the end of the socialist revolution. It's just one of the end products of the end of, you know, the uh, the, the socialist dream. Uh, now, anything and everything is going to be politicized to further special interest. Um... I was on to a really good point there, and then fucking uh, the hangout crashed. I was going to say something. Banksters are watching you, Brian. Yeah, I know. I... <laughs> oh, yeah. So, you know, the simplest way to avoid all of this is just don't go and borrow money. Don't live your life. I mean, why isn't anybody in our society right now saying, gee whiz, short-term interest rates are almost at zero, and... The the world is obsessed with very low interest rates. Why are the credit card companies still charging 30% interest? Why hasn't a single person in this world gone, what the fucking fuck? Anyone? I mean, doesn't, doesn't that seem a bit surprising to a single person here? That these motherfuckers can continue to charge basically usury rates? It's very depressing. Oh, no, let's uh, let's get uh, all upset about uh, statues that uh, represent uh, figures from hundreds of years ago. Uh, but uh, let's not complain about actually the real problem in our society that the 1% is just fucking milking the poor and basically creating this social cocktail of disaster because you know like i noticed oh, here comes messages hey, hey, hey now you're getting political brian shut the fuck up <laughs> but you know oh here's more <laughs> it's probably shane too um I thought it was really interesting that one of the sort of side effects of covid is that public schools are now seeing their staffs reduced because hey well uh, hey i'm not going to send my kid to kindergarten that's a fucking cesspit um so you can you can literally see the how do you call it the degradation the cannibalization of all of this sort of pieces that were put in place to operate this sort of modern society you can literally see them being dismantled day after day after day after day. And, you know, the people are not bringing up the fact that these goddamn one percenters have basically finessed all of the resources and shit that were supposed to be in place to prevent things like, you know, misunderstandings when the police come to settle a domestic dispute. I mean, why not have psychologists as part of the team to diffuse the situation? Oh, I know, because that means that the government budget is too big and we don't want to pay taxes. So a politician comes out, says, elect me, I'll cut your taxes. I don't know where I'm going to find the money, but we'll find it somewhere. Oh, yeah. It's going to come out of things like social programs to keep crime rates low. 
Welcome to your Biff Society. I remember when I fucking, back in that 2016 Olympics, I was, or Olympics, <laughs> election, I was going on about, you elect this Donald Trump guy and you are going to have Biff from Back to the Future running the country. Everybody remember what episode two of Biff's Back to the Future country looked like. We're heading that way. I don't know why I'm the only person out here saying this. I mean, it just, it's so frustrating. And of course, nothing's going to change. But I guarantee you we're heading towards Biff, so y'all better go buy your guns. I remember Biff, he had a gun. So if he had a gun, why can't you have a gun too? Oh no, well maybe maybe we won't go that far. I don't know. I don't know. Anyway, uh oh so they already got their guns. <laughs> Colleen's like, that's fine, you know them. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they don't need to buy any more guns. They got all the guns they need. <laughs> Anyway, um, I always re wasn't really quite sure where this uh, conversation was going to go here today, so I'm sorry. Somebody started off this video, can you finish that Jekyll Island conversation, and so here we are. Sorry, everyone. <laughs> but hopefully uh, we can put that conversation to bed right now. Long and short of it here, like I said, I really don't think it's in your best interest in the public to believe that we're at the top of the market. Um, I actually believe, uh, interestingly enough, that we're actually pretty damn close to the bottom of the market. So if we were going to look at sort of the Great Depression comparison, we're right here. That's not crash scenario. If we were going to look at the Ronald Reagan uh, coming out of the 1970s, uh, keep in mind, there was a famous, and you know, in the level one course that we teach, uh, we teach one of his uh, indicators that he built there was a very famous market technician that built really good indicators that right at this point said, sell everything, U.S. capitalism is over. What do you think? Was that a good idea? If you had sold here and said, U.S. capitalism is over. And he was a very famous technician. Like I said, built really good technical tools. So even the charts we're lying to him. So my simple message to you public is please, for heaven's sakes, don't get sucked into, you know, think of it this, everybody should write this down. It's always darkest before the dawn. Because that's exactly what I think the scenario is here. And it makes sense. It's pretty damn dark out there. But when it comes to investing your hard earned money, what you have to understand to win at this game is you actually have to be buying when they are what? I think anybody can figure out, finish that line. <laughs> Very good. Good, good. Well, it looks like all the uh, the TRI people here in the, in the lounge know what the answer is. <laughs> uh, Leon, Leon, you're getting a lot of these questions correct. Are you a TRIer? I think I see you around the TRI, or maybe you're just uh, doing that free. Uh... No, no, no. I mean, it's very specific saying, so try and get this right, right? As people who want to make money in the market, right, we want to be very good, Leon, selling when they are yelling. And you want to be buying when they are crying. So what do you think society right now? Do you think society is super excited about capitalism right now? Or is society a little sanguine? The sad part about it is nobody was saying sell in 1929 when you should have. Nobody was saying sell into the days of Camelot. And uh, and this was a tough one because, uh, you know, days of Camelot were here. Uh, this was like a rolling top. U.S. dollar was still very, very strong. But nonetheless, basically about 10, 15 years of hurry up and do nothing. I can tell you right now, nobody, and I was there. In fact, I try to tell all my students that uh, at this point, growth investors uh, were actually being laughed at when uh, they were saying, look at I'm selling, I want to get out. University professors, tenured university professors were laughing at big company executives saying we're selling we're getting out 
You know, if you look at this image, you'd go, well, you know, Brian, I guess those university professors were right. But this is bullshit. This isn't real. You don't want to see what this market looks like in reality. It actually looks, I think I showed you this before, it looks like this. There is that event. Mr. Growth, who's like, fuck, man, this is getting ridiculous. I'm getting out of here. He sold up here. University professors laughing at him. Do you think he was smart? I think he was smart. What's worse is, you know, like you listen to people like Jeff Bezos and, uh, and um, you know, um, uh, Bill Gates and, you know, Zuckerberg and all those guys. You'd think that, you know, tech was the next best thing and, oh, my God, it's so wonderful. So there is the NASDAQ. But if we do that exact same thinking on the NASDAQ, what you see is actually, uh, where are we here? Whoops, that's not what I wanted. <laughs> I was like, what the hell? There's your NASDAQ. Yeah, I missed the M. <laughs> so, you know, the irony of it all here is you cannot make... And this is Mr. Growth. Remember, he was Nortel Networks, right? Level 1ers? You current Level 1ers, uh, you, uh, you should be familiar with Mr. Nortel Networks, right? Do we have any Level 1ers here in the call here today? I don't know. Um, so the point here is... Hey, there we are. Hey, guys. So now can you see, uh, this was Mr. Nortel Network saying, I'm getting the fuck out of here. And the irony of it all is equity still isn't anywhere near those old highs. So it's, geez, it's like a half. Eh? It's just about half of what the value of that was. So Mr. Nortel Networks was right. I mean, that's the kick in the pants about all this. You know, this is what the public sees, and they don't understand economics. Right, this is what the politicians see. They don't see, they don't understand economics. From an economics perspective, this is our reality. But anyway, I'm just sort of probably tilting at windmills as usual. Um, what's really interesting about this is that if we actually start applying some very simple technical um, thinking, actually a lot of levels really jump out of us. First off, if I was going to sell something. What's, uh, what's the easiest tool to use to try and highlight good selling locations? Same anybody can get it. Okay, well that's being very specific. Fibs, good. I'm looking for one term in particular. Public FOMO, that always helps. Oh, trend identification, that's good. No, I want to be a little bit more specific, Leon. RLZs! Yay! Somebody got it! You know, And if you kind of look at it here, right, this sure looks like the top of the market, right? There's M's and stuff. What do you think the odds are if we do a reload zone from back against this low all the way against these highs, we're going to be coming into basically what where you're supposed to be thinking about tops of markets coming in. So, on this diluted basis... Oh, well, isn't that interesting? You can actually see that 61.8 is basically that battle point. So we might be able to work away a bit higher here. Uh, you know, ironically enough, from a GAN perspective, um, this actually is very natural. It's very normal. This is what should happen here. It doesn't necessarily mean that this is a good shorting location, but it's definitely a great profit-taking location uh, for anybody who bought this bottom, right, and bought the bounce. And how ironic, right? Basically, that is Obama's bottom there. And in essence, uh, you should have sold and taken profits into Trump's top. <laughs> how ironic, eh? <laughs> So, I mean, we can do the exact same logic going the other way. If I wanted to be a buyer of this asset, hey, I got a thumbs down. What, what did I just say there to generate that thumbs down? Hmm. Thought we were doing pretty well there, running uh, the whole video here with no thumbs down. And somebody just came along and hit me. Oh, well. What are we going to do here if we're thinking about we want to buy this asset? Same logic. Let's go the other way. 
Mm-hmm. Good point, Mark. Yeah, I would go RLZ going the other direction. So, ironically enough, from this uh, diluted basis. Oh, oh, look at that. I got three down votes. Hey. Isn't that funny? Did you guys see that? It's, I didn't mention down votes or any of that kind of shit for, uh, what have we we've been going for about an hour or nothing? Nothing. Then as soon as I mention that, then boom, boom, boom. In come some more down votes. Yes. What a bizarre thing this social media is, eh? Um, so if you were shorting up top here, profit taking location, not bad. Remember our sort of thinking earlier, we had sort of said off of that Dow chart, if this was a normal cycle, it would go up, down, up, then consolidate, and then break out. So I could see a nice pullback here against 50% rule. Seems perfectly logical. And then, of course, if I want to be a buyer, right? Uh, whoops. If I want to be a buyer, I probably want to think reload short zones. Or long zones, beg your pardon. Boom. So down in here. Oh, gee whiz. There's 61.8. Just happens to be against that kilo. Um, also, too, I like the idea that really this is a structural bottom. So think sort of like down, up, down, up. It's kind of messy. Don't get me wrong. But you can kind of think head and shoulders as you hear. So in essence, a pullback down into this level would just be actually, let's see if anybody on YouTube gets this. What would we call this pullback to check this breakout level here? We call it a bling? I won't call it a bling. Thank you, Alex. Excellent. Simone, is that how you pronounce your name? Simone? I still have that, uh, where's that chat box? That's over here. No, that's not it. Where is the site chat? Anyway, uh, Wyckoff, very good, very good. Andreas, good Leon. Chart looks similar to BTC. Yeah, yeah, very, doesn't it? Very, very. Do you think that's an accident, Leon? Anyone? Uh, well, 1920s over here, and you're right. Here is, I mean, this is the same shit. It's just different pile, eh? I mean, we could probably put that Dow chart on here. It's probably even better, right? Uh, who can finish this line? I'll know you were from last century if you can finish this line. NASDAQ, the stock market for what? <laughs> who knows how that line goes and if if you uh yeah <laughs> Cully. and losers right <laughs> that blue bmw's oh that's good ah, plus one plus one plus one love it <laughs> the stock the commercial used to go the nasdaq the stock market for the next hundred years anyway that was back last century any of you old timers can remember that. But, you know, that's a pretty good observation of you guys. So excellent job. Um, the uh, Dow, which, of course, you know, the irony of it all is uh, can anybody tell me who is the uh, who is the uh, the biggest uh, component in the Dow Jones Industrial Average right here? This is always hilarious. I always love quizzing people this. What was one of the biggest Dow Jones Industrial Average components right here? And would we have any interest in the company now at all? <laughs> no? Well, the company was called American Leather and Saddle. You wouldn't know it. You just wouldn't. There's no way you would know that. <laughs> so American Leather and Saddle used to be one of the biggest Dow components. And, of course, it's gone, right? <laughs> the way, I think they, they went out of business in, like, the 30s or 40s. Um, so, uh, you know, really good, uh, analogy. In fact, here we could probably just do it side by side. Let's see if we can do this. Are you guys having fun today? Uh, uh, do you guys like, uh, uh, you know, the down votes are coming as always. Are you guys over on YouTube? Are you getting value out of this today? Um, yeah, 
Actually, wow, look at that. Similarities are startling. We could probably put them side by side here now. Okay. So there is the NASDAQ, right? This is the crash scenario that you have to worry about. But we're not in that kind of environment right now. Do you see how this actually looks stunningly similar to this? Down, up, down, tried to break out, pull back. Down, up, down, tried to break out, pull back. Maybe we've gone a little too far here. I don't know. Maybe we're at this phase. Man, that'd be interesting if actually we were right here in tech stocks, eh? And everybody, of course, is calling for crash. But what should they be thinking? Oh, wait a minute. Actually, we're supposed to be thinking the exact opposite direction. So that's what's, uh, so, you know, that, that's the irony of all of this. This is why I find it so incredible that, you know, people actually thinking, like I see a lot of this talk, that this stock market is exactly, right now, is it exactly the same as uh, 2000? So here's the 2000 comparison right right here uh, this stock market is exactly the same as the 1999 2000 dot com bubble they couldn't be more different they couldn't be more different you have to understand that they're just they're completely different creatures anyway um, my hunch is, for whatever it's worth, folks, is um, through this period. Does anybody know what this period in the stock market was called? It was actually a very cute little name that they gave this uh, stock market. And unfortunately, I think we're going to have exactly the same thing. Anybody know what that was called? <laughs> So it's called Bing Bong, the running horse. Not quite. Might have been. May, maybe. I'm not quite sure with that familiar. But there was uh, two words. First word started with an N. Second word started with an F. A big crash won't happen until the masses give up on fiat currency. And so the question there, very good, Sam. The question there, Sam, is what's the alternative? They will only uh, crash the fiat system if there's an alternative. A oh, Bitcoin! <coughs> oh, cryptocurrency! <coughs> Excuse me. <laughs> have you actually heard? The, the feds have actually said down in the States that the stimulus that's coming in this next program is going to have crypto all over it. <laughs> So, you know, I do find it fascinating for you guys. You are in, like, literally the center of the vortex. We're, like, right down in the crucible. And, of course, the grinder is grinding us. But we're right there at the center of the fucking universe. <laughs> I mean, I tell you, just uh, my hunch is just go pick up a little bit of Bitcoin and maybe some Ethereum and a few of the half-decent projects. And into the next crazy ass cycle peak where we're in this nifty 50 kind of environment and NASDAQ's going on ape shit. I mean, if this scenario kind of plays out similar, check this out. All right? If we do an extension off of this range, what's 200% of that range? Uh, do we dare? Do we dare? Andre, where are you? <laughs> do we dare? <laughs> Anybody know where I'm going with this? Anyone? <laughs> yeah, no one? Oh, geez, no one here? Yeah. <laughs> Alex? Alex is getting on board. Uh, I mean, really, the way what we should be thinking here is one word and one word only. Back up, Bob! <laughs> hey, it's afternoon, so my neighbors can't be pissed off at me. <laughs> So let's just see where Mr. Foggenbaum wants to take us here. Survey says, and this is gonna, if this is right up in here, I'll, oh man, sons of bitches. Here we go. Bang. Oh, look at that. Son of a bitch. So 
I don't know. <laughs> There's Raf and Bobo sitting up there. Interesting how 1.618 actually lines up with uh, 4.669 off of that level. So, you know, I did sort of tell you about this. But we often see these, right? These cycles actually move in sort of two legs. So, if we are thinking along these lines, Jesus, these numbers are going to get crazy, eh? So, 200% extension from there to there. And the problem here is this wasn't a clean bottom, so I'm not quite sure how we would draw this. But if we just, I mean, I don't know. Remember, everybody, I'm a student of the market just like all of you. So uh, I'm sort of trying to learn this shit as we go along here, just like you. And there really isn't anybody who teaches this shit anyway. So we're just trying to figure it out as we go. So if we did the same, um, if this low, see this low here corresponded so beautifully with this low. That was perfect. This was really messy because they took it to a new low. But uh, interesting how 4.669 doesn't line up with 1.618 like that there. But and interesting too how 877 off of this range only gets up to there, but 877 was quite a bit higher there. So I don't think they're the same. But I wouldn't be surprised if we could use these as sort of reference levels going forward. <coughs> Might be interesting to look at actually just like the, the Dow and see what kind of numbers we can come up with there. Um, okay, you know, before we talk too much, because holy crap, I, have I been blabbing away here for like an hour or so? Um, yeah, I, I mean, if we do this same logic on Bitcoin, I think you see a lot of sort of similar price patterns here. Uh, so, you know, that's maybe not a bad direction for us to go in here. Hey, look at that. Corn's enjoying a nice rally here this morning. That's good. Uh, where's the best place for us to look at this? There we are. Oh, by the way, uh, actually, we did a little bit of research into this. Um, uh, Colleen, you're still here, aren't you? Uh, Colleen, you were asking about this UKG. Um, if I understand correctly, they still have a, the blockchain working on UKG versus ETH. Um, and I also, uh, it was funny, we went on their website, you can join the SEC and actually lobby to have your original capital given back to you if you join their, um, their, uh, their, I don't think it's a class action, but in essence, they, if you, uh, join their claim, uh, you can get reimbursed from these guys because the SEC basically said this was a fraudulent ICO. So that's also something, yeah. I have like 4,000 coins, a total of about 50 bucks invest in this. For me, I'm just going to let Trex do their silly little games. I mean, if these guys do get their act together and it comes back in at 100x is whatever, then fine, you know, I'll reinstate it. But I think you have to pay a small fee to Trex to do that now. It's better that they do that now versus before they used to just steal the coins straight from you. Oh, excellent. Okay, so you were able to get these things off. Just leave them in a cold storage wallet. The weird thing is, I went to the website. You could tell this uh, Unicoin sort of website. It was very, very sketchy. It was very, it just had shill written all over it, which, you know, really shouldn't surprise you. Uh, keep in mind, this half this space is just one big shill, right? You got to understand that. Um, so, uh, I just, uh, we, uh, for fun last night, we were sort of digging into this. So you could join the SEC lawsuit if you feel like it, but I did hear a lot of people say, just, you know, just throw them on a hardware wallet. And if these guys do eventually ever get their act together, then yeah, you can move the coins back on an exchange if you want for whatever it's worth. My hunch is this thing's toast. So anyway, sooner or there, but we were having some fun talking about that in the, uh, in the uh, lounge last night, so uh, I wanted to update you on that. Um, probably not best to start this. This is too focused on the short term. What I want to look at is probably something like this. There we go. So I still, believe it or not, feel comfortable. And maybe it makes sense with the NASDAQ going up and tagging Mountain Man a little bit higher. Um, I 
still feel comfortable about this uh, massive Gartley pattern that we drew on the charts years ago now. This has been on here for a long time. In fact, actually, look, you can see spring 19. That's when I first saved this chart. That's, what, about a year and a half ago. And, you know, we had great studies where through this we tried to figure out what the cost of production was and where we would find a bottom. That was a great study done by uh, Tony. I don't know whether he's still around or not. <laughs> then our very normal, uh, what they call a dead cat bounce right up to 61.8 mountain man levels. Very normal. Nothing really out of the ordinary here. Uh, uh, let me finish this thought, AE, and then I'll go back to your thought there, okay? Um. Then, ironically enough, after Mr. 61.8 tag and reversal, and, you, you know, if you're taking notes here, you want something to study in the future, if you see a market just go blasting straight up to 61.8 and not even respecting 38.2s or 50% levels or anything, just straight up, that in itself is a message from the market. And I remember when this happened, I was kind of like, oh, gee whiz, this must be carving out some massive formation. Uh, then last spring, you know, into that March dump. And what I really like about this dump was it really had nothing to do with uh, Bitcoin. This is all COVID and, you know, is the one, you know, our, is the one percent losing control of the system, blah, blah, blah. And, uh, you know, if you follow things like this, is the reload zone. So it made sense. Dips back down into here. Probably going to see some buying support. What's so sick is, uh, you know, there's site members who uh, really fine tune their trading and hunt things like 88.6s, uh, which is way down here. It's in purple. It's tough for you to see that. Uh, and we had some sharks on the site uh, last spring. And uh, my cohort that I do the... Uh, the daily briefs with, uh, and he's also a TA in the level one program. You know, I love highlighting the fact that he stepped in and he bought that 88.6 like a boss. Um, and there were a number of TRIers that did that. Hats off to you guys. Great trade. I mean, just fucking rock star trading. Sadly, of course, what do you think the public is thinking through here, right? They're thinking under the world, blah, blah, blah. Um, and ironically enough, nobody expected this. But interesting how um, we actually had an old site member who sent me this uh, chart of these two lines, this expanding triangle. And fascinating how he basically said, well, I'm expecting the market to come up into 78.6s and roll over. So congratulations to you, Jonathan. Great call. I doubt he's watching this, but beautiful, beautiful call. So, you know, we pulled back off of those highs and now we're kind of just sort of sitting in no man's land. We're not really at the top end of the range here locally. We're not even really at the bottom end of the range. We're just sort of midpoint. Um, now, for uh, somebody who um, was saying, well, Brian, you're not calling for crash. Uh, you're right. And this is sort of to your point, AE. I'm not calling for crash. But could I easily see Bitcoin here, for example, maybe work its way and lose 50% of its value here over the next few months? Sure. But that's not a crash to me, AE. If anything, this is just actually normal, healthy price action. Believe it or not, actually, what I would like to see is I would like to see the market work down here create some sort of base here and sort of break that big honking Gartley worry that I have. But, you know, we actually have a number of site people that are saying, you know, it looks to me like we're heading up top here. Uh, if we just, you know, consolidate here, then Gartley our way up, then that sets up that NASDAQ kind of nonsense. Uh, you know, 61.8 hits there. And then, you know, I think we'll have to work our way back down Will we call that a crash? I suppose the public will call that a crash, but I won't. Right now, I hate to say it, folks, but I would just simply say this market is range bound, right? There's the top end of the range. There's the bottom end of the range. And we're just playing in a trading range. Could you have one day where the markets opens up and goes, boom, 
back down to the bottom end of the range and in one fucking orgy it's a big wipeout like this sure would i call that a crash scenario ae no so uh we have to be careful about the context of could price go down and a lot of people who FOMO bought the top get absolutely destroyed if they bought on margin and they lose everything? Sure, that happens all the time in the market. But would I call that a crash scenario that the economy is rolling over and you know, a mass bankruptcy, mass foreclosure? Um, and brother, can you spare a dime? No, I don't think we're in that scenario. And I mean, just look around. Have the banksters said, nah, you know what? No, no credit for you. No, the banksters are doing the exact opposite scenario. <clears throat> Again, that doesn't really paint crash scenario to me. So does that help uh, AE? I hope that helps. I mean, this is a trading range. As far as I'm concerned, this is a trading range. The only problem here is, is this a good place to be buying? To me, this looks like you're buying just about exactly the middle of the range, eh? Uh, there's no edge here. I mean, yeah, it could go up. Yeah, it could go down. Ideally, we want to try and concentrate on, you know, boxes, green boxes, ideally, for buying. <clears throat> so that's sort of the corn on the big picture sort of view. And believe it or not, folks, I know you're not going to like me saying this, but I definitely like uh, this uh, scenario. This is all this is is just the market acting uh, symmetrically. Right, we went up, and how do we just symmetrically uh, cor correct this this rally? Doesn't mean it's going to happen. Usually, the market never repeats itself exactly, but it kind of rhymes. So I do like dips. You know, just healthy fifty percent retracements. This would just be normal. Um. <clears throat> I think I showed you on like that NASDAQ chart and stuff like that, like 50% levels, that's normal. That's just business as usual. So, uh, you know, this uh, move from that high down to that low, you should expect 50% bounces. That's what that is. You know, and you could even argue this move from here down to here, you should expect the market to bounce 50%. This move here to here, you should expect 50%. This move here to here, you should expect 50%. This move here to here, you should expect 50%. I mean, it's just what markets do. So when I see an image where the 52-week low is there and the 52-week high is here, 50% is sitting at about 8,000. I feel very comfortable that that number should be traded to. If anything, like I said, if we just go and bottom out and continue working our way higher, then that really does have me shitting my pants that this is some sort of massive long-term Gartley. We hit this 16, 17,000. What do you think the public's going to be saying about Bitcoin if we're up here at 15, 16, 17,000 again? Are they going to be bullish or are they going to be bearish? That's right, Colleen. I don't think anybody on YouTube understands this, though. Not a single post there on YouTube. Boo. Public's going to be super bullish. And then what really sad, of course, is we all know. If the public is super bullish, uh, should we maybe cool our jets? <laughs> yeah, well, that's the whole point of the Gartley, is that it does 61.8, does 78.6, I mean, just fucking fibs like a boss, then it hits 78.6, like fibs like a boss, but we should be watching for divergence up in here, and of course, watching public sentiment, and my hunch is there's going to be one hell of a kick-ass short trade that sets up right up top here, and yeah, we'll see how it goes. <clears throat> but that's a yeah actually uh, well you can't again we're you know we're kind of like in no man's land right here so you can't say that this is for sure to happen and really what should naturally happen is we should come back down do 50% revels and clean up so for me to come out here and say yes the market's going to go up or yes the market's going to go down guaranteed that's that's actually irresponsible of me and that's half of why 
I think a lot of people in the financial services industry get sucked down this road is you sell subscriptions saying, hey, this is going to happen. I'm predicting the future. You're guaranteed to make money. And unfortunately, I just don't do that. So as a result, you know, I, I love the positive feedback. I love the, you know, at least this guy's not blowing smoke up my ass. But at the same time, you're probably never going to see any of my videos go viral. You're probably never going to see me, you know, like, oh, he's a total rock star. I'm kind of the chicken shit guy. But I can guarantee you the chicken shit guy here, he's going to be here 20, 30 years from now. Just doing the same damn thing all over again. Uh, oh, boy. So uh, Alex is saying on YouTube they're getting all crazy again. So on YouTube they, that they have two accounts and they pull the what happened shirt. <laughs> oh, that's terrible, eh? Oh, Jesus. <laughs> uh, hey, good, Leon. You're, you're a, you're a, uh, a general. Uh, you're taking advantage of the free trials. You're watching the free videos. And now uh, Leon's already spitting out my cliché. So there's a guy who's actually getting his money's worth here. Way to go, Leon. Uh, I don't think it's in a good idea to... Uh, Brian is going to be... Oh, <laughs> oh shit. I, no, I doubt it. <laughs> Mind you, I respect that guy. Um, I respect him because uh, he started out basically at the bottom. And just being who he was, he lived the American dream. So I really respect that guy for that. Joe Rogan, his name. Um, yeah. I mean, I think he comes across as true. And I like that. I'm not really the biggest uh, fan of fighting and that kind of stuff. So I never really was a fan because he went down that road. But, hey, yeah, you know, he saw an opportunity. It was his passion. Uh, and he went for it. So I, I have great respect for him for that. Um, you know, they, uh, the people that I don't like are the people that are, their conversation is just one direction constantly. You know, maybe they have a, a thesis. Um, but it's a thesis that's based on fear. It's a thesis that's based on... Uh, on uh, uh, pulling uh, the emotional response out of you, and I really, really don't like those kind of people. Okay, so Bitcoin. I can't really tell you anything new to do here today. That's kind of why I spent a lot of time just sort of talking bigger picture stuff. We're kind of just sitting in no man's land right now. Uh, Ethereum, same sort of thing. And I'll tell you, if I can get dips down below 250 on Ethereum, love it. Love it, learn it, live it. It's just, oh, so sexy. And in a weird sort of way, I can kind of see that playing out. Can you guys see the bear ABCD forming here? You know, you can see I've already started to draw it. So, uh, AB. And CD. Oh, well, that's convenient. Look at that, eh? <laughs> you can't write this shit any better. There, I totally did not do that. <laughs> There's, I always find it hilarious when that shit happens, eh? I mean, that's ridiculous. <laughs> so there you go. I don't know. That might happen. It might not. Like I said, uh, don't get into the habit of predicting the future. But, you know, if it does happen, don't be surprised. Um... The one thing I don't like about this that's really kind of screwing with me is the fact that this is a V-top. So technically at some point this top should be tested. Uh, so my hunch is, you know, if this is a correction, I, I again, kind of like Bitcoin, I don't think any of this shit um, is uh, happening because of crypto itself. Uh, I think this is more a function of, you know, 2020, massive you know capital flows uh that can move on a heartbeat um very emotionally charged environment right now and in a weird sort of way of course crypto kids hate when i say this but i get the feeling that at institutional order desks now bitcoin and crypto is just another button that they push risk on hit the crypto button boom 
um, you know, uh, program trades go in, buy $100 million worth of crypto right across the board. All the orders are pre-formatted. Everybody in crypto just goes, holy fuck, what the hell just happened? <laughs> and then that also, unfortunately, works the same on the sell side. So I think that's sort of the environment that we've gotten ourselves into now. Uh, but, you know, new trade ideas. There's just nothing for a guy like me to do here right now. Nothing. You know, if I want to sell, I might be nice and patient. And I could very easily see a really nice harmonic pattern that sets up at this 88.6. Remember we said, uh, you know, V tops. This should be tested at some point. Uh, and then maybe we might actually be starting to carve out bearish bot setups that take us down into these levels. And ideally on my bearish bot setup, I like to have three, if this is a short trade, three lower highs. So I've got one, I've got two. So, you know, maybe we start thinking bearish if we test this high, roll back over and like am out here. And my hunch is if we start, you know, studying these numbers, the 25 entry is probably almost exactly where I drew that line. Let's see what happens. Survey says, there's our setup. We went 33, but no more than 66. So we'll clone that. Uh, thought we cloned that. Maybe we did. Hey, there it is. We'll drag that and project that off of that line. So there's your A, B, C, D. Now, as traders, we want to try and break this anticipated move into chunks where I'm going to risk one chunk looking to make the other chunk. And ideally, we'd like the other chunk to be bigger than our risk chunk. So that's how this bot really works well to help traders is we see an anticipated move. So how are we going to trade it? Well, if I break the numbers down, oh, isn't that interesting? I drew my level there, but it turns out 25% of the move is there. Boo. So what this is, the bot, and why I like it so much, and, you know, you're really going to, you know, people in the, um, in the level one program, uh, and there are a few level oneers in this call today, right? What I'd really like you to do is those personality tests because we really have to figure out what type of personality you are. And then based on your personality, then we can figure out, you know, what kind of trading plans best going to work for you. But it turns out I'm an ENFJ. So uh, if you actually go and look up what uh, ENFJ is, I really like structure in my trading. It speaks to me. It's the person that I am. So that's why the bot set up very structured trading. It really works well for me because it speaks to my personality. So point of the matter here is A, B, C, D. If we're going head down here, I'd want to be hunting shorts off of say two, or 351 area. When I'm going to risk uh, basically to a break of these recent highs, that's uh, 395. So basically risk about 50 bucks looking for a potential payday of about hundred and fifty dollars right three to one risk reward so that's what i'd be watching for right now but like i said i've got one high i've got two highs so i don't even have enough of structure here to even help me hunt for a trade just yet i've got location um, we could start looking at indicators to see if we're starting to get rollover on things like MACD, on things like RSI, on things like uh, Williams Percentage R, on things like uh, volume. Not really getting any signals here at all from these guys. And then, like I said, uh, price structure wise, like I like location, indicator confirmation, and then some sort of price structure. So our third price structure would be, can you politely come up, test this high, roll over, and fail through our 25 line, right? And then I got one high, two highs, three highs to risk against. I've got structure to help me frame the trade. Away you go. But I ain't got anything here. So, you know, and it kind of sucks for the past week or two. I've been saying the same messages been wondering what I'm going to tell you guys on these free YouTube videos and stuff because there just isn't anything to do right now. So sorry guys. 
Um, I know Shane and Andrew and I still have a few more sort of New Year puts. I think it's a free position that we have on, on ETH. So we still actually do have some puts. Uh, I suppose if we do get this blowout move down into the 200s, uh, then uh, maybe we'll look to liquidate them. But for now, eh, just sort of cooling my jets. And of course, you know, we got these crazy celestial events coming up. Um, I wanted to just for fun show you another one of these celestial events because keep in mind there's like six of them that are happening this year. So this was another one that's happening. It's the Saturn Pluto cycle. And what's so cool is you can see where they wax and where they wane. You can see assets uh, grow in value, assets fall in value. Where they wax, assets grow. Where they wane, assets fall. Um, where they wax, assets grow. Access wane? Well, wait a minute, Brian. I thought you told me that assets are supposed to fall through this part of the cycle. Aha, they did. But remember, this is a fucazi, right? They fucked with the supply of the currency out, right? So, you know, the public looks at these kind of studies and goes, No, you celestial people, you're all full of shit. I don't want to listen to you. But what they don't understand is actually this is right on cue. It did exactly what it was supposed to do. It's just the the powers that be fucked around with the currency, which is dangerous, I'll tell you folks, dangerous. So what I did here was I said, okay, here we are. This is a new cycle. <clears throat> this is the past three cycles. Let's just throw them on the charts. And I hate to say it, folks, but that's pretty much what I'm expecting our future is going to look like for the next 15 years or so. Um... You know, this is, uh, this is the growth part of the cycle. And that's the irony of it all, is that you guys actually should be super stoked. Um, we are heading into a growth period. Nobody in the world is looking for growth, are they? <laughs> we are heading into a growth period. So if anything, that makes perfect sense. Remember Mr. Uh, Nortel? He was made fun of by the university professors right up at the top of the market. And man, I guess uh, we never did get to the fucking level one question. Sorry, everyone. Remember, Mr. Nortel, he was made fun of at the top of the market because he said, according to our studies, the world is not going to grow anymore. He was right! But we're not in this part of the cycle anymore. If anything, you have to be thinking this is our future. Nobody's thinking that, are they? <laughs> How did, what did I just say there to generate a down vote? That doesn't make any sense at all. <laughs> Stupid. And they're like, hey, I want you to talk more about crypto, damn it. Quit talking about the stock market. <laughs> I guess. Maybe what I said on ETH, they didn't like what I said there about Ethereum. Eh? I don't know. Hey, it looks like crypto's enjoying a nice little kind of... Hey, look at that. I mean, what letters of the alphabet do we got going on here, folks? Uh, it's not day traders. Mm -hmm. The funny thing is about these M's and W's is it's not rocket science. It's the same shit. I would be a little careful. You know, usually what happens when I do these weekend videos is uh, the market's pointing one direction in Sunday morning when I do the video. Then I'll go and hang out with Liam and I'll come back and they've topped the market and actually it's starting to break down when I come back. And so it's like, uh, whoa, wait a minute, I thought you were bullish. <laughs> so just remember, if you're looking at like 30 minute charts, this whole fucking message can change here on a dime, right? So just be prepared for that. Uh, but, you know, in the short term, looks like they're taking the market up. That's good. Uh, you know, the message I'll be giving to the public tomorrow, I always like to work off of these uh, little charts. And it'll probably be the same message. I don't see any reason why I would change. Uh, where the hell is that? Over here, right? Um, I do have three lower highs working on the corn. That's not good. That means that this bearish bot actually is active. And believe it or not, actually, I've been waiting for this Wyckoff check of these lows to actually seriously consider about buying a put. So actually, this counter trend rally here this morning actually is is uh, is exactly what I wanted to see. It took forever. 
Uh, so you can see, and actually uh, level three years, remember our three high low method. Remember what we were talking about in class on Saturday. Do you see how they dumped the market, they rallied it back, then they dumped it again. So all the noobs, they all come wicked uh, and pile in and, and move their stop there. So in essence, this stop, they move their stops here, but what they don't see is this is actually a level that the institutions want to get short from. So remember, these are shorts. I'm short, so that means that's a buy stop. So they trip up this level. Those buy stops get triggered into the institution's sell orders because they want to sell this closed line level. Do we have any level threeers on the call right here? I'm almost your opposite, Brian. I am INTP. Okay, yeah. Well, so the point there is we have to take some time. We have to figure out what kind of trading plan best suits INTPs. Are you in the uh, school program, Michael? We should talk about that in class. Uh, do we have any level threeers here in the call here today? Because this is exactly what we did yesterday. Oh, Andre, yeah, you're right. you're here. Alex, you're here. Felipe, I think you're in level three, aren't you? So what do you think, guys? Do you see how this is exactly what we talked about yesterday? I mean, it's like identical. <laughs> you literally can't write this shit any better. So be careful here <clears throat> about getting too bullish on this event. This looks a little dangerous. Um, now, the one good part about this is uh, if we clear through horizontal support and resistance levels, what are we supposed to do? Let's see if anybody can figure this out. So whoever downvoted me there just took it back, sort of saying, uh, okay, maybe this guy isn't that much of a dick. But uh, just check in with uh, Colleen. Colleen, am I, am I still a loser? <laughs> I know if I ask Shane, that's, uh, the answer is pretty easy. Oh, there's the down vote back. Woo! <laughs> anyway. Oh, more down votes. Woo! -hoo, party. I know. And all you guys are going to be like, stop looking at those down votes, Brian. <laughs> okay. So the point here is, can you see, uh, our rule is you break through horizontal. So, oh, my goodness. Wow. The down votes are really rampant now. There you go. Um. The, uh, the rule at TRI is if we break through a horizontal support and resistance level, we are supposed to look left. Hey, there you go, Rocker. Good job. So the issue here is if I look left, oh boy, that's basically a straight line up all the way up to here. So believe it or not, do you see on the profile, and I was mentioning this in the, uh, in the site today, who can tell me, is that profile full or does that profile look a bit empty? And actually, we just did this. Um, we just, uh, no, actually, I think we do this next week for the level twos. Oh, somebody sent me a message over here. What's going on here? Uh, yeah. Yeah, you're right, Julian. You're right. You're right. Um, yeah, okay. So uh, back to you guys. <laughs> I was reading something else. We still got some work to do here. I mean, ideally, this profile to tell us that we fully explored this range and the market's ready to go to a new level we want to see this profile full. So that means all of this, all of this, all of this. And actually, there was a cool stock that we bought recently that was a key reversal. And its profile just looks solid like a rock. So uh, trust me, this shit works. So the point that I would just say here is, can you see how we could very easily zip all the way right up into here to fill in that profile? All right, fill all this area in. So don't be surprised if there's a bit of play up in here. And then, of course, we have our nice little trend line that we've drawn here. Uh, well, I thought we did. Uh, so, you know, we have a rule at TRI. It's not a bad rule. Write it down if you don't know it. 
But we can't really take a trade on a trend line break. Here's a perfect example. You know, somebody might have been like, hey, Brian, that's W, man. I got to buy that. And that's a trap. So they break it out. And, of course, the public, they're all like, hey, oh, man, that's a buy signal, right? And they go and buy. And then, boom. So <clears throat> we have a simple rule at TRI. You cannot take this trade until we get a W on the other side of the trend line. Whoops. Oh, I didn't want to do that. I'm going to put you back. All right, so you can kind of see that there's a war developing here. Looks a little trappy, to tell you the truth. Sure hope you guys are getting some good value out of this today. It's kind of a fun video, but I can understand that some people are like, this is a waste of time. Because unfortunately, I'm just not giving you any new trades to take here today. But uh, here... You know, I, I still think, because I know we used to have one site member here. He used to trade these things just like an evil bastard. And oh, by the way, he drove a, a blue BMW. And he would always hit. Um, he would erroneously call this a neckline. That's not the correct terminology. But, you know, this clothesline level, that's probably going to have a lot of institutional players uh, interest right there. Um, me personally, because remember, I'm kind of like a chicken shit, right? So what I would personally prefer is, you know, let this market rally up into here and then give me like a nice, like, uh, let's say like a nice inside bar reversal, you know, maybe even a nice harami. And then you hit that inside bar reversal going short. That's, that's what I'd like to see. Um... Or, you know, what the hell, uh, let's get even more creative and uh, let's just give us a nice M up here to short. That's what I'd love to see. But remember, I'm a chicken shit. I go slowly. I don't like to take a lot of risk. And when I do take a trade, I like to look over in the corner, just see a big pile of money sitting there. And I just walk over and pick it up. Like shorting here. Yeah, you know, I mean, it is a bot level. There is a double top working. There's a triple top. Yeah, it could, but, you know, looking over in the corner right now, believe it or not, you know, for the lower time frame people, I would say looking over in the corner, I think there's probably a long trade and look to take profits up in here. So I want to see, I look over in the corner, I go, holy shit, look at that beautiful top and look at momentum collapsing and it's right, I can front run the bond with the profiles filled in, we're at the top of value, fucking A, man, let's go. <laughs> so... That's how I like to trade. But that means that a lot of the time I just don't take trades. And that's fine. You know, at some point you're going to have to get to a comfortability point. I don't have to force a trade because I don't need the money. I mean, I got lots of money sitting in the bank account. I don't charge anything for these YouTube videos. We give 30-day trials away for free. The courses cost like nothing. I mean, the, I hope you all realize and this should get massive upvotes. I'm not here to make money off of you people. If anything, what I want to do is I want to trade my own accounts. I'll make money with my own money, thank you very much. I don't need your guys' money. I would like to help you and have you guys join us at TRI, and you're making tons of money. Um, but what that does mean is that maybe a lot of times I'll come on these videos and I'll go, you know, I just don't have anything here to do, so I'm sorry, guys. There's, there isn't a trade for me to do right now. So uh, that if, if there was a short trade to develop, let's watch this over the next few days. That's what I'd want to see. So let's see what happens. Okay, obviously with the corn and the bigger markets not doing much, you know, if we look at this poop index and really DeFi looks exactly the same. There's just not a hell of a lot going on here. Big old M, right? Everybody knows when you see the market smiling at you, what should you be thinking? And if you don't know this, write this down. If you've never heard this before, write this down. If you think there's some value, Cheryl, give me an upvote, please. <laughs> and uh, why are you over there? I thought you were on the inside. <laughs> Aren't you inside TRI now? Are you now outside TRI? Oh, well. Um, anyway. So... You know, what you should see on this image shouldn't surprise anybody. 
Shouldn't surprise a single person. Yeah, how did I how did I get a down vote out of that? <laughs> That's really good usable information. And yet somebody goes and down votes. And I know you guys no, everybody listening to this, you don't have to send me messages about downvotes and these idiots and stuff. I'm just off having fun with these clowns. Uh, and I probably really should. I There should be a way that you just get rid of that nonsense. Oh, look at that. I got two more downvotes. Thank you, guys. You're, you're swell. Okay, I think I'm going to leave the rant at that for today. I hope you guys got some value out of it. Uh, somebody remind me next week to get a little bit more focused on the level oneers questions. If there was a question in that document that you're like, fuck, man, I totally wanted him to answer that, just PM me, and I'll be more than happy to uh, take some time and answer. No big deal whatsoever. Remember everybody here, uh, you know, I, I, here's another good analogy. Um, a week or two ago, the BC government, of course, uh, waged war on this vaping shit, and I quit smoking a couple years ago because I you know, probably should. So I started doing this vaping stuff, and then, of course, the government shit on vaping, so I was like, okay, fine, I don't need it. But it turns out that the vaping has a higher nicotine, so I was actually more addicted to nicotine after the vaping than not. Well, go figure, blah, blah, blah. The point I'm trying to make here is um, I sort of tentatively said, okay, that's fine. I'll use that event as my sort of officially quit smoking. But then I sort of, you know, and I did notice that because I'm such a nicotine junkie, um, I went right off the deep end. So I just asked myself, is this really the best time to be putting not only yourself, Brian, but also I do understand that I actually have a bit of a responsibility here just to sort of keep, you know, somebody's got to be at the tiller just to keep things just sailing along, just to keep reminding you guys that no, really, there isn't a hell of a lot different going on here. This is just the capitalists playing their capitalist games. Um, that if we plan, if we're methodical, if we're systematic, if we have our three unrelated reasons to consider taking a trade, if we obey risk management principles and don't get too greedy and don't put yourself into dangerous positions, then you know what? Everything will be just fine. Ironically enough, if you can actually take advantage of the public's fear and the public's doubt and the public's uncertainty, I actually think you can make a lot of money if you can think out the next few years into that next growth cycle. So, with that said, does it really make sense heading into this eye of the storm here and Brian goes and tries to quit smoking and gets all jacked up on nicotine addiction fixes. <laughs> Not really. So I went and got some more of this goddamn vape from another site. And I've just made a promise to myself that, you know, let's get to March of next year. When hopefully most of the shit is settled down and people aren't freaking out and we have some political leadership. And COVID is a, is a past tense conversation. And we can start thinking about growth for the future and what the world's going to look like, going to look like on the other side of these recessions. Um, so maybe it's a con to myself. The nicotine con me into believing that I'm doing this really for you guys. <laughs> but I don't want to wage my war with nicotine. I want to be sort of in that sort of as balanced and as sort of like mentally a good place because i can tell you the world right now it's gonna be really dicey and we need as many positive supports as many sort of you know it's not that big of a deal what's going on we can get through this um as much as possible Soon as we get back into sort of, okay, everything's calm, no big deal, business as usual, then I'll start freaking out uh, uh, on, uh, on losing the nicotine addiction, okay? 
<laughs> All right. You guys have yourselves a great afternoon. Hell, I, I even got so bad that I pissed off one of my uh, dearest uh, customers who I love making reference to. Uh, well, switch to. <laughs> so the problem there, AE, is that it's the nicotine. It's not smoking. I mean... Uh, smoking's fun and all, but it, I don't miss smoking. It's the goddamn nicotine. I mean, fuck, it's worse than heroin. So uh, that, that's the problem. So uh, Hell, I think I told you guys I used to row when I was there. At least I aspired to be a rower. <laughs> Let's not... I, I wouldn't say I was a rower. I say I was... Uh, I, I, I had the aspiration to be a rower. And we weren't even allowed to smoke then. You had to run like three, four miles a day. And so everybody did chewing tobacco. <laughs> I mean, do you guys want me to pick up chew? Maybe I'll pick up chew. <laughs> oh, excuse me. I just spat on the microphone. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Enough blah, blah, blah. I got to go get pretty for the boy. The boy's expecting me in the next hour. So uh, how long was that? Did I? Yeah, I, I think I went on quite a bit there. Sorry, everybody. I, I hope you got some... Uh, some uh some value out of that um and um uh, slow and steady works the race okay or wins the race everybody don't don't put yourself into a dangerous position over the next six months i just don't think it's worth it and the irony of it all buy when it snows sell when it goes really take advantage of this winter accumulate so that when we get back into next summer you're banging out doubles like a boss like everybody else Okay, guys, have yourself an awesome rest of your day. All the best, and bye for now.